So one of the most important tenets of uh, art handling is fully understanding your route from point A to point B. Then you can kind of work backwards and start to understand, well, what do we need to do in order to properly track and pack all of these objects as we move them from one place to the other. That involved a lot of meetings and conversations and a lot of fine-tuned analysis, looking at artwork material needs uh, as well as stress points and things like that so that we could develop packing and creating solutions that would accommodate those needs. And truth be told, once you determine what all those needs are and fabricate them and have them all situated, the move itself is actually a fairly quick process and it, and it generally goes fairly smoothly and seamlessly. And so there's a lot of front end preparation to a very brief moment of moving things over. And then there becomes a rehousing moment that's actually fairly satisfying. Throughout the building, we kind of talk about two different areas. We talk about a kind of straight visual storage, and then we kind of talk about this idea of a curated storage. And straight visible storage is, uh, you know, pretty typical museum fixtures, painting racks, kind of space saver cabinets that we had them make all glass so people can really see in. And that is kind of even here where objects are sort of at rest. And then we have these other moments where um, the objects are at rest, but they're kind of in an active rest standing here in Rayoshita's, this was meant to feel like his apartment. And we used photos to put objects together that we know he lived with. And so really bringing people closer to the experience of what it might have been like to be at the site and really identifying those sites that could benefit from a kind of more immersive experience versus some of the sites that could, you know, stand with paintings on a rack. The storage solutions kind of run the gamut here at the Art Preserve. It's everything from very traditional wood casework that you might see in early museums to powder-coated steel vertical storage racks for 2D pieces or, or taller pieces, lots of flat file storage solutions, uh, lots of cabinetry um, with glass and, and um, sort of open fronts so that everything's visible in those situations. We also have a lot of custom solutions that we've had to develop in order to accommodate the needs of uh, some of the larger or more complex aspects of our collection, things like trays, systems, mounts, just so that we can uh, appropriately house a lot of the work that we have. If we're talking about Lloyd Boland's storage solution, that's something that we've sort of coined as monumental storage, and it's us trying to understand what it means to actually store an entire house and all the components of those house when you completely break it apart and all, into all of its segmented parts. Building out the exhibitions presents its own kind of interesting problems and we have to come up with really interesting solutions and so I get to collaborate with the curatorial team to find those solutions and, and really sit down and figure out what's best for the artwork. A lot of the artwork can be really fragile, it has some kind of strict guidelines that we have to follow in terms of what's safe for the work and so coming up with creative ways to make mounts so the work can stay stable or uh, protect it from light or protect it from vibration and so we're always thinking about the best possible way to do that through our design process. You know, if the site still exists, it's really important for us that we're not trying to take the place of the site. There is no comparison to going to Fred Smith's Wisconsin Concrete Park or, you know, to go to Grandview in Hollandale. So we have work here, but we're not trying to recreate the site in any way. We're just trying to show our holdings and draw people's attention to the site. Whereas, you know, Ray Oshido, this is it. Like, we are what it is now. And so kind of that attempt to honor that it's gone and that we are now that, I think that was some of the conversations that we were having. The hardest objects to move are absolutely the bone towers. Those are the things that from day one we've been putting in the most mental energy trying to understand what is the best way to get them over here to the art preserve so that they are accessible. And we're dealing with a situation where that work hasn't traveled from the building for over um, you know, 30 years. And it is an extremely you know, fragile object in, in its material as well as um, the way it is aged. Basically the only pressure you can put on it is completely even pressure over the whole surface as well as taking into account the fact that they are in no uncertain terms a, a form of you know, miniature architecture. So understanding how you might want to move something like a building, allowing it to move and sway in some instances but be rigid in others is sort of the, the starting point for how we started talking about moving the bone towers. 
Some of the most challenging pieces was the Loy Bolin, which is right behind me. But it was a really collaborative process. There was a certain amount of engineering that we had to figure out to get the house to kind of stand by itself with most of its components being removed. And on top of that, the art work is incredibly fragile as well. So a really difficult one, but also a really exciting one. It felt like a really big accomplishment. I think the most fun piece that we got to install was just recently the Bola Simpson whirly gig out front. It was kind of one of the first large outdoor installations that we put in. The weather was nice and we were outside, so it was, it was perfect. Some of the mechanisms that we've come up with in order to sort of counterbalance making everything accessible at all times is a fairly complex uh, light system where you'll notice that there are motion sensors that are specifically designed to turn on and off based on when visitors need to engage with specific spaces. We also have shade systems to um, keep out as much light as possible. And we do also have some dark storage solutions, for instance, the flat files or, or some of the racks below or behind, which allow us to sort of rotate new works in over time, uh, allowing other works to rest. What I learned about the collection during the installation of the Art Preserve is, is really what it's comprised of um, in a really deep and profound way. If we talk about Jesse Howard's wall on the second floor, there's something about seeing all of the, the words that he was trying to communicate through his signs and through his artwork all sort of installed in this 17-foot wall, which is you know, more or less the way he would work on broadsides uh, on Sorehead Hill in some instances. And so that's the first time where I was able to encounter the work in that way. And there's something I really appreciated about that installation as it was coming together. But then when you find yourself in Ray Yoshida's home collection and you start to really delve into all of the individual objects and other artists and how much rich history and how much rich sort of uh, material culture information lives in that space, that's another one that it's hard to not feel uh, a profound experience when you're in there. Stella Waitzkin, like again, that, that installation is, it's, it's gorgeous. And, and the fact that you know, you're able to see the work in that way in which it's really highlighted by the way things are lit and the way that the work all interacts together within the wreck of the UPS and the other details of the Lost Library. It really does vibrate when it's all in one space. And so I feel much closer to the artists who originally produced them in the sense that if, if you look close enough at some of Eugene Brunchenhain's paintings, you see his fingerprints. You know, if you you know look at some of the works of Mary Knoll, you really see uh, instances where she painted over something else, uh, things, things of that nature. And so it's really only something that you could learn by systematically going object by object, figuring out how to pack them and track them and move them and then rehouse them in their new space. And that was something that was, I feel very fortunate about. I also feel lucky because this is the first time in almost decades for some of these objects that they were able to be accessed in that way and seen and handled in that way. I hope visitors are able to gain an appreciation for artwork, but I think specifically it can start to open their eyes to maybe parts of the everyday that they aren't always accustomed to looking at, that they can kind of see their neighbors' odd sculptures or yard art that strikes a nerve and realize that there's a lot of importance to those objects in the world and that they can learn to appreciate those as they move through the world. I think my main favorite installation in the museum is the Emery Blagden installation. It just feels so powerful when you walk in. I feel like I can feel the energy when I walk in there. And each piece sculpturally is just beautiful. And then thinking about those as a whole, as a group, it just really, uh, it really gets me every time.